okay so um you were uh, uh you took you got a degree in mech so um and, physics, and then and you physics. went okay and then you moved on to high intensity laser physics research so what really set you down on that path was it uh like eventual uh, a process which <laughs> helped you realize that this is what you want to do or was it something that just clicked one day nothing in life clicks one day and you know much as we would like to believe we are masters of our own destinies life has interesting things to do right to offer you so i would describe my entire career as brownian motion <laughs> meaning i i i knew that i wanted to do physics and i i actually had job offers uh, you know i had campus placement uh, then i also got jobs in the public sector and so on uh, one reason i did not go abroad because i felt that maybe you know i was i didn't want to go abroad at that particular time but many of my uh, batchmates did i don't know what would have happened if uh, i had tried that path but somehow it didn't uh, appeal to me at that time then when i had these jobs and then i had but i knew that i was not going to be an engineer i wanted to do a phd in physics so in a sense i pulled myself away uh, from the pressure shares <laughs> that were exerted on me to take up a job um generally but i think my parents were extremely nice and they um went against the grain you know of thinking in those days they allowed me to pursue this phd and in phd um i was i sort of um i somehow got into this laser lab i don't think i ever said i wanted to get into this this area i knew very little about lasers at that time but i joined uh, professor kk sharma at iit kanpur um i was assigned to that lab and initially i was sort of uh, clueless was this the right thing for me uh, did i really want to do this or there are other areas in physics that are more interesting everything on the other side looks more interesting than what you're doing right that's that's a human tendency but some events happened i had wonderful seniors uh, who were extremely who would take great pleasure in doing what they were doing the experiments that they were doing i was exposed to some very nice uh, you know again another nice peer group at iit kanpur and i saw some fantastic things you know the the some of the best lasers arrived at the time when i was there and uh, i also had a good chance to interact with uh, several physicists from across the world in, in the area of lasers and laser spectroscopy because of two or three wonderful conferences international conferences that were held and so the lasers sort of you know i became more and more fascinated with lasers and my phd was on nonlinear optics which i think uh, the advisor chose to sort of branch out he was doing laser spectroscopy till then but then he said you know maybe ravi you should think of this and he gave me a lot of freedom which i did not realize at that time how precious it was and so i would read i would go off with this idea that idea he would gently advise me Uh, against doing something which may not work and doing something you know in favor of doing something that might work we had lots of learning to do because those were the days when uh, even telephone calls were rare to call the us about a broken laser was a huge task right you don't whatsapp these days your problem to the parent company and get a response in half a minute so it you have to develop a lot of skills yourself you have to develop resilience you have to develop perseverance and uh, i did self, um, i was exposed to again very nice uh, uh sort of a peer group and a very nice mentor group in terms of the professors there there were some amazing people at iid kanpur one of the best best physics departments in the country and probably still is and uh, of course iid kanpur always had this reputation of um you know a great undergraduate physics program um and also it was it was again something that modeled itself and derived a lot of help and inspiration from the american system so there was a lot of contact and there was a lot of uh, the buzz was really right so 
I sort of moved on, uh, kept moving, and the directions emerged. As I said, if you you don't really write down your story ten years from now, I I don't think any of you do that. But when you look back, you feel yeah, all those gentle nudges, sometimes a severe push or a pull in a certain way, they all make sense now. And it, the laser sort of, I got more and more fascinated by what I was doing. And I was hooked. This is what typically happens in, in research. When you start, mm -hmm. and I would say, um, I must admit, and it's just not right. So I should say that, confess that you have opinions about subjects. This is not worth doing. That's not worth doing. This is better. I would want to be this. But as it turns out, I realized one thing. It doesn't matter what the subject is. If you are fascinated by a question, you will do anything to answer that question or you will try your best to answer that question. If you have to learn chemistry, you learn chemistry. So you may not have thought that you're not, you're a physicist and not a chemist, right? If you have to learn biology, you will learn biology. If you have to learn anything, engineering, you will learn engineering. This is what I think research should all be about and people should be open. This is again something that was brought to me uh, very, very uh, tellingly in those days that you should be open, you should examine, you know, respect all subjects equally. And there's also this business of theory and experiment. And in India, theoretical subjects are considered more, you know, sort of hi-fi <laughs> than the experimental ones, which are considered somewhat, you know, not the best guys do theory, that kind of thing, you know. But then I also found some best guys in the U.S. actually do experiments. They are known in the U.S. technology uh, prowess is driven hugely by the wonderful experiments that they do in basic science. Right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be such a technological uh, powerhouse. So we discover all these things and we shed our old notions which were wrong and try and acquire some new thought, new way of uh, living. And I'm glad that I learned a great deal of that. And I think in my career, probably IIT Kanpur has had a huge, huge role. Those formative years in my PhD, they have stood uh, you know, with me. They have guided me ever since. So, and now that you have like guided 30 PhD students on your own, uh, how, much, how, how much of an effect was your own PhD in this? And what do you keep in mind while guiding them? Um, what difference do you oh, Again, so this is something you, you know, you say that you actually imbibe things from people without your knowing. I'm sure you have had experiences like this or you will probably have experiences. You think that, you know, you are moving in a certain group, you have a mentor, you may or may not like everything he does, but somehow they grow on you. You know, some of the things that they do, you adopt. And one of the things that I really respected my advisor was for the freedom, right? So that, that he gave me. And I tried to be like that. I don't know how successful I am, <laughs> though I think I'm probably more a, a less patient, more of a driver than, you know, I should be. But again, I should tell you, I have, I think, graduated all the places that I've been, I've truly been blessed. I mean, I went, and this is again, people who are looking at the future will say, oh, I don't know where I'm going. I'm so nervous. I'm so anxious. I said, just hold your you know, hold yourself tight. Good things are going to happen to you. Because when you move from place to place, it's obvious that you'll feel there's a new culture, new way of doing things, new expectations, new environment. And it's a natural thing to see whether you fit in there or not. Maybe your generation doesn't really have because you're now exposed to many, many more things all across, you know, in your day-to-day -day lives and also on the internet and so on. So you know how, how things are all across the world, at least in some peripheral sense. So I've been in great places and each place has actually boosted me much more than I've done for the place. I think they have done things for me. TFR gets the best possible students. And I would just say that they are just not good on the, in the Indian sense or just based on the Indian pool. Some of these people are, they would make great PhD students anywhere in the world. And I have particularly been very, very fortunate to have students who have excelled you know, in everything. And some of them, um, I'll be happy to admit, and I'm happy to admit that they probably are much smarter than me. Right? So it's a pleasure to see 
how somebody who is supposed to be a student actually teaches you much more than you have taught him and it's anyway it's a general learning that all of us do uh, helping each other learning from each other and so on and i think um, because the students are driven uh, because the students are so gifted the typical advisor and tfr doesn't really have to do too much um, though given that there are so few of them in tfr we lavish our attention on them and we sort of infringe too much on their personal you know on their uh, research space we uh, something that i have to guard against uh, but great students great collaborators great coworkers at tfr and in a place like tfr the challenge is always there but the intellectual environment is also extremely nurturing right? i mean you have very bright colleagues whom you can always learn from uh, if you don't feel that it's a problem for you to learn from you know some people have this hang up over learning from colleagues but if you don't have that it's something that you on astrophysics you can talk to somebody here who's an expert on biology you can talk to somebody who's a you know sort of a international expert and to so these kind of kind of things and the students always coming up with wonderful ideas everything is you know on an equal footing and there's no hierarchy or nothing like that in fact even in um, i think in bits too i don't think there was a hierarchy so i probably had never lived with hierarchy in my life <laughs> iit kanpur is very very liberal and open and encourages all round participation equally and tfr is also like that so i think i have truly been blessed i would say it's not my uh, where i have reached is not because of me probably mostly is because of the winds that have propelled me in this direction right great students great environment and uh, probably a little bit of things that i did that that's a really amazing story you know like your whole journey from your whole journey and your whole collective experience from everyone around you like it stretches us in ways you can't even imagine so uh talking about phd like that is considered to be you know the go to option for a career in physics so um are there any alternative options for students if they want to uh especially in physics except for phd any alternative options do you feel that there are any and um, yeah um actually this has been the traditional route is phd is something like an apprenticeship you learn how to do research and then these days there is a second layer of apprenticeship above that which is called the post doctoral research after phd you go to another lab where you try and become more independent than you have been in your phd right there so you take responsibility for younger students and you nurture them you mentor them you start writing thinking of your own research problems and then you come back and hopefully look for uh, a faculty position somewhere that's a traditional route but there are people who haven't done phd's who have moved into in academics i think the standard route is still the phd for a faculty position uh, but in industry there are no such things there are several masters in engineering masters in physics who can actually join the industrial r and d not much of it is done in india uh, but i think it's picking up it's picked up over the last uh, decade or two and with this all this uh, the government's push on making more things in india and challenging the indian young young uh, people like you to deliver for the country you know new things on par with the best in the world of course on a global footing in the sense not in isolation but taking the best from everywhere and making something even better out of it so i think there are things that you can do with a masters degree where you are you can be trained in a certain area and then you can pursue that area but even industrial ph industrial research also probably relies a lot on um, looking at the basic skills that you have acquired in a ph so i would say if you are serious about a career in physics do a phd a good phd where you learn lots of skills and then after that you don't need to be a faculty member in a in an iit bits or iser or a university in the us or wherever that is but you can also um, join the industry and the industry pays uh, in the us at least they pay much better than the academics uh, academia 
uh, in India, I don't know how these things are, but I think at least many of my chemist PhD friends have moved into industry and they have really thrived. They are in the manufacture of novel drugs, you know, designing new drugs and making them. Uh, in I think uh, in uh, there's a company in Pune called Lupin. I have a friend there who has really risen. Then I think Glaxo, there are people. And also uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, several American indus industries started setting shop in uh, Bangalore for their R&D units. Like I think the GE came at that time. Texas Instruments was one of the first guys who came into India. And I think they still recruit. I, I'm sure they recruit from bits uh, as often as they can. Texas Instruments was a big thing in our time. You know, oh, okay, TI. TI is recruiting campus placement. So, chalo, let's go. <laughs> Mostly for the engineers and computer scientists. And so, it was, I, those, those things will increase. But one of the good things that I see now is that it doesn't matter. You're not looking for uh, a foreign company to set shop in India, to set up shop in India. I see something really amazing and I wish... I had been a part of uh, you know, this movement. It was existing in our time. Um, the belief that you guys have, that you can be the best in anything that you do. This is something that has grown over the last uh, two or three decades. It was not so much except for a few very strong people. Many people felt that you're, you were always a follower of the best in some sense. You know, the te technology that's developed there is implemented here. Probably not so well, but if you implemented it well, you all already are known as a star. But that is not the original thing that you were actually doing. What you were doing was the what you are doing now is amazing in the sense that you guys all want to have startups to solve a problem that nobody has solved before, right? Some of you will, of course, be improving things that are already there. But even if one out of hundred of you comes up with a totally new idea which is truly Indian, you know, of Indian origin. I think that's remarkable. And that is probably the environment is shaping up now for that. And they call that the buzzword is the ecosystem, right? The innovation ecosystem. So I hope all of you are, will be big contributors to the innovation ecosystem. Uh, whether you're physicists or even in physics, they can be hunted in, you know, many of the physicists, they actually design the next generation technologies. Some of the things that we do in our lab, can really spawn the next generation technologies. But we haven't had that attitude till now. We are just waking up to what is the possibility that we have, the potential that we have. So go forth, do whatever you want, do it well, and then strike out in directions. And hopefully, um, BITS will you know, now honor future entrepreneurs who have made a big mark in, on the Indian scene. Till now, it's been the guys from Silicon Valley who have made a mark and so on, right? And I, you'd be amazed how many of the big companies have bits guys as their CEOs and whatnot. You guys have a list? Probably you do. Yes. Bits uh, actually does, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I was surprised. The famous example that was given is that of Sadir Bhatia from our times, from the 90s. Hot male guy, right? But I believe he spent only a couple of years in bits and then moved on. But then there are true blue bits guys, you know, <laughs> bits degree yes. holders who are um, in top positions in the U.S. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think this is like a great time to like let, let's talk about the experimental research aspect in India. I think we were already talking about how like in your time. Uh, uh, doing experimental research was still a very novice idea. And so now that you, like, now that you're like, uh, yeah, that's so many cool stuff in this field, uh, how do you approach an original idea? And how, what kind of uh, difficulties or how, what kind of benefits do you get from doing it in India? Okay, so, um, you know, that in, in the last few decades, the government has invested more money than they used to do before um, in, in basic science. It's still not enough. I would say that they should increase it to a much larger fraction of the GDP. Several new institutions have come and these institutions have built up good experimental programs of their own. Otherwise, TIFR was one of those rare places where 
great experiments were done on par with the best in the world. You know, whether it was worrying about whether the protons decay. So there's a polar gold field experiments about proton decay, which TFR did in the 60s and 70s, 70s, I think. Right? And then they had this cosmic ray experiment again in polar gold fields, uh, where I think TFR was the first one to discover the atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, but that program later got shut down. So TFR has been great for experimental science, and that it, uh, it was its character, right? Not so in other places. There were a few places like IIT Kanpur had a good experimental program, uh, but um, and uh, the atomic energy labs like whether it's Bob Atomic Research Center or TIFR or IGCAR in uh, in Chennai, they all had a very robust basic science programs right? because they were all funded by the atomic energy. Uh, you know, initiatives. The rest of the country was not so blessed, but in recent times, I think the funding has increased. More important than the funding, the confidence that we have in ourselves, I think has tremendously got boosted. Because of our close links with the rest of the world, that's one thing that globalization did. Um, it bench, you know, ability to benchmark yourself against um, the Western world, whom you admired from a distance earlier mixing with them, having collaborations with them, and seeing that you know you can be a world beater too. That confidence is, I think, one of the most ingredient, important ingredients for success in experimental science, in any, any effort, but also in experimental science. Uh, because you know when you have uh, breakdowns in experiments, when you are thinking of something new, uh, and things don't work the way, you really need to kick yourself up, you know, push yourself, saying that, this, I will make this a success. And that I think is an important part of the character that has been built up in the recent times. So now I would say there's certainly more money. It has become easier to get equipment uh, from abroad. Uh, there's a lot of support even from the, uh, you know, in not in our area, but in many other areas. The Indian industry is also uh, branched out and making things in collaboration with companies, they have learned the technologies, they're making things for Indian uh, labs. So I think it's very interesting. And I think some of the great things have been done in recent times, mainly because of all this enabling, uh, you know, environment and uh, the base that we are building up. But I must admit, and I must actually caution that this is still a long way to go, not enough. It's easier to do, but we are also living in a world where the challenges are, you know, the difficulties are much more. In the sense, people are talking of a much larger scale of doing things. The way the changes are sweeping us, who would have thought that, you know, you'll have internet of things? Who would have thought that this artificial intelligence will become, artificial intelligence will become such a big thing in, in our day-to-day -day thinking now? Everybody thinks of machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I'm sure BICS has a wonderful program on that already. <laughs> so are they teaching you all this stuff? So these are the things. So adaptability is one thing, uh, but you certainly need more money. You need to do things so that your confidence level goes up and you need um, much faster. Communication is improved, of course, but it should be even faster in terms of exchanging materials uh, across the globe. Because science is truly a global thing, global enterprise. So it cannot be just confined to uh, one country, one continent. Free exchange of ideas, equipment, materials is very, very crucial for overall success. And I don't think we're looking at Indian science or Western science anymore. We are probably looking at just science in the sense, I want to do the BEX experiment. Why should somebody, somebody else, you know, either in India or somewhere else, why should they do that? I want to be the so that kind of, I want to be the world beater kind of feeling. That I think is taking seed now. So hopefully in the next uh, 10, 20 years, you guys <laughs> will do great things. <laughs> it's easier to say that all the time, right? <laughs> Which I <laughs> <don't> <laughs> no, you will be surprised when you're giving an interview like this, maybe sometime later. <laughs> So, uh, so talking about we talked about these different uh, laboratories uh, in India and around the world. 
you yourself established uh, a ultra short laser pearl, high intensity laser laboratory, right? So, uh, motivated you to establish and um, what were the um, processes and all the hurdles that you went through to do it? Okay. So I wouldn't like to portray it as, you know, I mean, it's very nice and you get a lot of mileage if you portray it. My God, I had so many troubles and I overcame them like this. You can make a fancy story out of it, but far from it. We just went step by step. You know, research in the West, the fact that they innovate so much because they have a huge, you know, achievement list behind there, you know, as they moved along. And for them, it's always a next step, next step. And the next step to them is reachable, seems just like the next step for them. But for the other people, it looks like, oh my God, there's so much of, uh, you know, distance to cover, right? So I would say, um, I began with no laser in TIFR in the, in the lab I joined, right? It was doing iron, iron molecule collisions with uh, accelerated iron particles. But then, and the, as I said, the environment was so enabling, so nurturing, so encouraging that we bought our first laser, a picosecond laser in 1993. So a year after I joined. And from there we went to a half, a, that was picosecond. We went to a half a terawatt laser in 1997, which is a femtosecond laser. Then we went to a seven terawatt laser in 2004, right? And uh, that was again 30 femtosecond uh, pulses. Then we went to 20 terawatt in 2006. And finally, in 2011, we became a 100 terawatt laser, which in 2017 became a 150 terawatt laser. So the reason I'm telling you all this is that it is not that, you know, one day just move out everyone, I want to set up a big laser facility here. It didn't happen that way. It was a climb, step by step, right? And at every stage, you have to show what you've done with the money that has been invested. And I'm glad that uh, by the way, it's always, uh, it's probably not right. And certainly I would not encourage that to say that one person established a facility. That's never true. It is a lot of work, exceptional colleagues, right? A great uh, um, leadership at TIFR that saw future in this program that felt that it was worth putting money in here and kept holding the hand all along. And all the colleagues and uh, students and everybody who pitched him. So it, it's just that, you know, it's unfortunate to give the impression that, you know, and I don't mean to. I think it's a, something that all of us collectively set this up here. And we're all proud of what we did because these kind of things are, uh, it's one of those really nice facilities around the world. We have had collaborators from elsewhere coming and using this. Um, doing experiments with us in TIFR Mumbai in, in Kolaba, right? And uh, sharing the knowledge with us and we publish papers jointly with them. We work on common problems. In many other areas, it is that unfortunately, we still have to reach a stage where we become totally equal partners. For example, some of the big accelerators, Indian physicists have to go there to do experiments. But at least in this little area, we have had uh, about four or five groups across the world who have come and done things. Several, uh, a group from Japan, from Osaka University has been a long standing collaborator. Groups from the UK have been collaborators. Uh, we have had collaboration with a group in Israel, uh, in Italy, um, so many other you know, labs, just they all want to come and work with us here, uh, which is a good sign in the sense that, you know, they, they think that great experiments can happen in the TIFR lab. So it was set up, I would say the, Hurdles are typical for, you know, you have to think of, you have to pitch for the money, you have to write a proposal, the proposal gets refereed, vetted, you have to defend the proposal. But if you have done, if you have performed in the past, TFR has always, uh, you know, pulled you along. If you have been doing well, they have encouraged you, they have given you more, more and more money uh, and whatever, little, whatever support you wanted to the extent that we can, that they could. Uh, they have actually given that. So I would say it's uh, it's TFR that has set this up. We also have accelerators. I told you for a for an institution that has done Kohler Gold Fields experiment, for an institution that has set up 
the most, I think, one of the unique radio radio telescope facilities in Pune. It's called the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. That is truly uh, something that all of us are extremely proud of, right? It's one of its kind. It's one of the best radio telescopes in the world. And people from across the world are using it every day. In fact, the Indian usage is only, I think, 30%. 70% of the time is taken by international scientists. You have to bid for time on that telescope. Then uh, we have also sent satellites, you know, payloads on satellites. You may have heard of Astrosat. So that Astrosat actually was launched in 2015, has three payloads uh, in which TFR uh, played a major part building up. Right? So for some an institution that has done all this, I think um, the laser was a small thing to do. So I'm glad that I found myself here <laughs> than, than elsewhere. And another project that is also a big, gigantic project, unfortunately had some hiccups over the years, is the Indian, India-based Neutron Observatory, uh, which was proposed in the early 2000s. It had ran into uh, social, political problems and hasn't made much headway. But the time it was proposed, around the same time, China has also proposed something. China made much more progress. Uh, but the Indian thing got, uh, you know, uh, clogged up in uh, bureaucracy, in the political games and so on. So progress has been slow. But GMRT is a totally uh, TIFR thing. The India-based Neutron Observatory, of course, has lots of Indian institutions uh, participating. And AstroSat, similarly, I should acknowledge that several people, several institutions in India, uh, Ayuka, uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, they all are a part of uh, the AstroSat project. It was launched by, of course, ISRO. It's, it's just fascinating listening to like, all the like, things you have done. I think, like, I don't think we can miss the opportunity here to kind of talk about your research because as an undergraduate, and most of our viewers are going to be undergraduates, uh, your research is very intimidating to us. Like, approach and a lot of these a lot of uh, the undergraduates do not have that kind of experience in you know building an original experiment and then like writing a research paper like from scratch and everything uh so i think this is kind of a vague question but how do you approach an original idea and how do you like kind of realize that actualize that in the end okay i again the answer is familiar i'm sure you've heard this in the last uh, half an hour <laughs> that, you know, you never really, you're always, one of the famous statements is that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Who said this? I'm sure you can figure out. It's Maybe. a very famous statement that if I've achieved anything, it's because I've stood on the giants or on the shoulders of giants. So we always have a background to any problem. We learn, then we pose the next question, right? And posing the question is a part of the training that I said that I learned over the years, starting from IIT Kanpur and so on. And by the way, the problem solving um, attitude that BITS um, encourages you to do. It is a very, the first time I encountered problem solving was there. It was not that you had to memorize something and blurt it out in the exam. Just, excuse me, can you just pause for a minute? Yeah, sure. So just a phone call, yeah. So the fact that uh, you know you don't mug up like in school, and then reproduce what they said, describe ideal gas law. Nobody want, wants you to describe ideal gas, gas law in, in bits, right? They're always telling you to do the, um, you know, solve the problem. Uh, <laughs> so um, problem solving is a great thing to learn, which I think I started learning from the time of you know, undergraduation in, in uh, bits Filani. And if you are like that, then, you know, the attitude of, Posing questions is something that you have, you learn by training. And then when your hand, you know, your hand is held in your PhD and your advisor tells you, think about it like this, think about it like this. Um, that provokes more and more questions. When you read a paper critically, you disagree with the author, that provokes questions. You want to disprove somebody, that provokes maximum questions. For example, sometimes you feel that this cannot be true. So I'll make sure that I, I prove this wrong. That's the biggest motivator for finding questions because you're trying to find out exceptions to whatever that guy is saying. So there are various ways of generating problems. Many times it's a continuation of something that's been going on. 
perhaps a more interesting um, aspect that somebody has not looked at so it need not be daunting you know if you sit somewhere and say it's like i have to learn a new language how do you learn a new language you learn the alphabet then you learn how to make word then you learn the grammar then you read text in that language to read literature then suddenly you're saying things that amaze you my god how did i say this in this language which i had no clue about some years ago so you also own this process as you go along and that's extremely important for a scientist to inculcate this you know in his thinking that the moment you hear something you hear somebody say something um you ask for is this true is there an exception can this be improved right is there a counter what about the inverse of this so these are all ways it just keep going on so when you hear a colloquium at tfr uh in the first 10 minutes itself there'll be a question by an interested person because he's thinking along with the speaker trying to understand what he's saying what a he or she is saying and then it says he becomes a participant in the in the process of and of course the speaker also learns tremendously by giving a colloquium at tfr because we our colloquia can be really really long sometimes right because people are so curious to learn so this it's the same process of learning um, that is there's nothing different from uh the usual learning uh, that you do right to education except that now you have to uh, there are no problems at the end of your book chapter you have to generate the problems yourself <laughs> and solve them <laughs> and hopefully you will find problems that are solvable right if you find a problem that cannot be solved you'll be beating your head against the wall all the time so uh, one of the greatest scientists i think um, i don't again recall the name now he said it is not you know you don't need to know everything that has been done you need to have a knowledge base but you don't need to know you don't need to know everything that's been done you need to know one thing that is not been done that is worth knowing and then you make a mark nobody can do everything but from a background by learning from books from your experiments from your interactions with others um by listening by reading a uh, novel about novel idea sometimes when i read a paper i say oh my god why couldn't i think of it so that is the kind of things that that provoke you this guy has thought so far what would have gone on uh, you know his mind or her mind when this uh, thing actually progressed how did he think of or how did he or she think of this right so i'm trying to do gender balance in my own <laughs> in my own speech now somehow that he always comes we should get rid of this so it's like that it's a growth it's a process of growth evolution which is which happens for everyone there is nothing unique about uh, it could be different for different people but the, you know the the details can be different for different people but the basic process remains the same so you don't need to sit at your desk and say i if i'm going to be a great scientist how do i begin or where do i begin the thing is just begin and then you will you will become a great scientist <laughs> so but don't keep thinking and stop doing everything saying that i don't know what to do then uh, you know that's what is called the interference that you know you have two paths and you are deciding to go this way or that way and you can't decide and you stay put where you are so that is what is called destructive interference because you have not propagated at all <laughs> so you should move pick up something do it well because all learning is about the same in different subjects the basic processes are all the same and that's why phd teaches you it actually trains you uh you absorb by observation how other people are thinking how they are solving problems also somebody who joins our lab uh, for a project you know a six month project i have had uh two guys from bits hyderabad bits vilani hyderabad uh, last two years ago i think they all did one guy did a six month project one guy did a one year project and we just threw them into the actual experiment we didn't give them a special corner where they would do you know like your typical undergraduate lab there's a manual you read that you push things here you monitor something you make a table and then you go off you plot a graph no i said i don't even know we are trying to find out what we should be doing in this we want to measure this how do we measure it 
So we gave them real life exposure of a research in a lab. And I th big thing and challenging for them. But after some time, they got into the groove and they started enjoying. So that, don't bother. That's really inspirational, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's all from our side. Uh, if you have any, if you have, uh, if you have anything to say for like our audience, people who are interested in physics, um, we would love to hear. Otherwise, yes. So I want to say that you know you have great opportunities today while you are at Bits, Pilani, uh, and given the environment, the fast changing environment, the the opportunities that you have accessible to you on your own on the internet and everything else. It's amazing. It's a great time to be um, young, like that's what you are. Make the best out of it. Make the best. It looks like a, you know a parental advice, but I'm not your parent. But do do take my advice seriously. It is the world is opening up in myriad myriad ways. You can't even imagine what you would be doing or how well you could be doing if you pitch your basics right now. In the correct, uh, with the correct intention, with the correct strength, learn whatever you're doing the best that you can, right? And uh, build up networks. Networks are extremely important for you. Build up a peer group. Connect across the world with people who have similar goals or who have interesting questions that they're answering. Join networks. It's very easy these days on the internet. Um, build up uh, your competences, not just in your in your subjects but in your communication, which is going to be very, very crucial. The guys who um, convince the world are not probably the best guys, but they say things the best way. Right? This is so important that you have to say things that make sense to people. Of course, you don't misuse this talent if you have. You have to say the good <laughs> things and persuade people to do the good things anyway. But communication, written, oral, all of it, you guys, I'm sure, are um, you know very good at that because you are learning your class participations, you have debates, you have all these things. But writing, I'm not so sure. I think writing is something that people neglect, thinking that they'll learn later. But to express yourself in very, very attractive language in print is very important, not just for literature, not just for uh, a political speech, but also for science. In fact, some of the best journals in science, like Nature and Science and several others like that, they challenge you to write a first paragraph about your paper within 150 words and convince the world why, uh, why your paper is so interesting. Imagine in 150 words, you have to say, you have to, you know, hook the, hook the, you know, you have to get the guy hooked on uh, your, uh, on your theme and then you can tell him and then he would be tempted to read further. So it's the same thing when you're giving a talk, you have to get the audience's attention in the first five minutes or so, right? You cannot say, oh, there's a long story around the interval time in a movie, the real theme will emerge. Maybe the audience has walked out of the movie theater by then <laughs> or they have turned off the Netflix, <laughs> they, have, they have gone off to another channel. So. Say things interestingly, surprise yourself, challenge yourself all the time by trying to constantly improve. And I would say you're getting the best education. Uh, own it, right? Literally own the education that you have by improving yourself. And also a bit of preaching, uh, give it to other people who are not so fortunate. Because I know um, that I was lucky. You guys are all lucky to be exposed to a system which was truly, um, you know, encouraging, which taught you the real things in life, right? Both from my undergraduate days, then PhD days, and in TIFR. For that, we have to be extremely grateful and we have to pass on. So if you get a chance to mentor younger people, please do and give them the right advice. Uh, particularly if those people are uh, challenged in some, by circumstances or by, uh, by financial status or whatever that is, uh, encourage them and pull them along because that will give you, I think, 
among the you know the best satisfaction that you can have in life is to say I made a difference to somebody. And of course, as I said, I'd like to see great startups, big innovations from India, uh, driven by big Svilani graduates, wherever they are in all the campuses across the world now, and make a difference to, you know, we should become more and more, we should become a technology powerhouse in the next 40, 50 years. Um, we shouldn't be looking at, we should, of course, use the best anywhere in the world. We should be exporting things to the world. We should be sending things, selling things to the US, the best products, to China, to whoever needs them. And I'm glad the vaccines are now going uh, bang, bang all over the world. But we should make in, in technology, in electronics, in computers, in, in hardware, in ideas. You know, I would like a new, new paradigms to come from India. Like computer was a new thing. And uh, Windows was a new paradigm. Unix was a new new way of you know, coding and doing all that stuff. More of them should come from India. Path-breaking thoughts. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time out of your visit to come home and talk to us. And it was really amazing, really inspirational, and a great pleasure to have you here.